de Melang. I'm here to speak about innovation for renewable energy systems as a neglected approach to economic development in Africa. First of all, I'm going to try and unpack the concept of innovation. As the schematic behind you shows, it's really a fuzzy concept. It means different things to different people. It has a colloquial understanding in everyday use. It also has a specialist understanding for people who monitor innovation, who track innovation, who study innovation. Nevertheless, people have different understandings of what this innovation means. So I'm going to clarify a few concepts. The concept of creativity is usually used as a colloquial understanding of innovation. It refers to the birth of an original idea, uh, spontaneity, and this kind of uh, notion. Another concept is the idea of invention, the proof of concept, the demonstration of the applicability of an idea as a device, as a concept. Also knowledge, applying knowledge to, to solving a problem. All of these are intrinsically interrelated with the idea of innovation. But there is a distinction. The distinction is that innovation must have an impact, either in the marketplace or in a social sphere. Innovation also is not the activity of a lone inventor or a lone firm that's uh, coming up with new ideas and new products. Innovation really requires a system in order to have this impact we're talking about. In other words, if an inventor creates a device and no one uses it, is it an innovation? No, it has to have an impact. Now, the basis for innovation is learning and competence building. In other words, you have to know how to do something in order to improve upon it. So learning and competence building are really the foundation for innovation. The new thinking in innovation Many of you may have heard the terms, uh, this country is moving towards a knowledge-based economy, or a learning economy, or an innovation-driven economy. And so many countries are saying that rather than being resource-based, depending on your natural resources, agriculture, mining, and so on, and essentially having an extractive philosophy, this is not going to lead to long-term sustainable economic development. You really need an innovation-driven economy to leverage your knowledge bases and improve and modify those resources you do have, natural resources, human resources, in order to keep coming up with something new. The four concepts uh, related to this kind of learning-based economy, and this is at the national level, at the country level, at the regional level, is this idea of learning. And we distinguish four different kinds of learning. There's learning by searching which is considered the holy grail. This is R&D, research and development, space exploration, advanced technology, nanotechnology, biotechnology, this stereotypical scientist who is in his lab just thinking 50 years ahead of the line. But, as I stated, this kind of knowledge has to have an application in practice. And so learning by doing is technical know-how, manufacturing. If you understand the science, can you make it applicable in the real world. There's learning by using. The users, or the intended users, need to know how to use this technology and have to feel that it's useful to satisfying their needs. And then the fourth is learning by interacting. So learning by doing, those who know how to build things, and, learn, and those who use them, the users and the producers, need to interact in order to produce the outcomes that they seek. So if you have a fast-growing economy on the basis of innovation, what's the problem? We have found that, and many scholars have found that, this innovation can actually have adverse consequences. Adverse consequences on social inequality. There's this idea that emerging technologies actually exacerbate inequalities rather than bridge them. You've heard of the term, the digital divide. There's this idea that uh, modern technology or technology-driven growth has adverse consequences on the environment in terms of air pollution, water pollution, land pollution, and so on and so forth, and climate change, of course. Innovation-driven economies can sometimes have adverse effects on poverty. 
So those who are wealthy or in the middle class, upper middle class, get to use fancy gadgets. And a large majority of poor people are nowhere near reaching these technologies. And these two communities coexist in the same, com in the same countries, in the same cities, in the same towns, and so on. And so innovation scholars are saying innovation must address not just economic growth, but environmental sustainability, social justice, and poverty alleviation. A critical constraint, though, is the demand. If you have a bright idea and there's no one to use it, then your idea remains just that. So you have to identify a demand. In the context of Africa, fortunately, unfortunately, but fortunately, we have basic needs that are widespread across the continent. I identified three basic ones, sanitation, clean water, and energy. If you don't have those in the modern world, there's really no need talking about advanced and fancy technologies, iPhones, iPads, SK Array, and so on and so forth. If, you, if we can address these three, then we, we know that the society at least has a baseline from which to grow upon. So let's take a look at energy. This is a map produced by NASA of the Earth at night in the year 2000. As you can see, Asia, which is north of Africa, Europe, North America, South America, at night there's a decent amount of light which implies access to electricity. Much of the African continent, though, is dark at night. And it's not just because people have turned off their lights and they've gone to sleep. There just isn't any electricity. Unfortunately, the approach, and this is a recognition, the approach to addressing this problem of electricity has been through large centralized, top-down planning, building large dams, large coal-fired plants, natural gas-fired plants, oil-fired plants. In fact, the uh, first prime minister of India famously said that the dams are the temples of modern India. So in the 1950s and the 1960s, new nations emerging in Africa and Asia believed that in order to be developed, you need this impose, these imposing structures, large-scale structures, that showed you had entered the technological age. Unfortunately, in the case of dams, we find that subsequently they have these huge impacts, downstream impacts, ecological impacts, loss of species, waterborne diseases, and so on and so forth. The other thing we find is that most people still don't get access to electricity because those who get access first are those who are the large industries who need it in bulk and who need it consistently. Although the justification for these projects is that there will be access for the poor, there will be access for schools, there will be access for, for hospitals and so on. In reality, the only people who get them consistently are the big users and then some uh, Civilian users also get them, but those who can pay for it, and those people have to pay exorbitant prices. So the result is that less than a third of sub-Saharan Africa has access to electricity. In, in about 10 countries, it's less than 10% of the population has access to electricity. In the rural areas, it's even worse. It's about 1 or 2% of the people have access to electricity. It's not even in the radar. People wake up with the sun, and go to bed when the sun sets. And in the modern world, this is just no longer acceptable. So this schematic behind me shows the status of power demand in West Africa. So the MET demand is about a third, 30%. And then the demand shortfall, as projected by the power utilities, is 70%. So that includes those who don't have access to it. And those who do have access to it, but even those who have access to it only get it intermittently. They experience power shortages very often and so on. 
However, Africa is rich in renewable resources of all kinds. Solar power, the sun shines all the time in most parts of the continent, great wind resources, biomass energy, as long as there's the cash crops and even food crops, the waste from these crops can be used to produce energy. Yet we rely on resources that are exhaustible without diversifying the energy mix. So the alternative to this top-down approach that I indicated, this large dam, large powered, fired, uh, fossil, fire, fossil fuel powered stations, is distributed generation based on renewable energy that generates energy close to the end user, right next to the, where the end user needs it. You don't need extensive transmission lines. You don't need to, to generate energy in bulk. You can actually tailor it to the needs of a household or a community. But this idea is not really new in Africa. As early as 1960, in an important book known as Black Africa, the cultural and economic basis for a federated state, the late Senegalese professor, Sheikh Antedra, outlined all the energy resources on the continent. He highlighted also all the raw materials available on the continent and identified eight industrial zones for economic development and industrial development on the continent. In 1985, 25 years later, he gave a keynote address to a group of African scientists in Kinshasa of what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo, known as Zaire at the time, and said, we need a strategy for energy plurality. Whatever resources you have, you have a right to energy security and you have to use them. However, we also need an order of priority. We have these rural areas who don't have access to basic energy, so why don't we focus on decentralized energy systems that the people can assemble, the people can maintain, and then focus on the large-scale uh, energy generating resources. Secondly, we need to transition from fossil-based dependence to a renewable energy dependence. So the fossil-based energy resources are used to produce renewable energy technologies such that we can wean ourselves gradually away from it. And so the fossil, the oil and so on can be used for the synthetic industry, but not for energy generation. 1985 was when the early evidence of climate change started coming, and he already was aware of this. He was a nuclear physicist and was aware of these developments and said Africa must create a strategy. In the 2000s, around 2005, here in South Africa in Johannesburg, Professor Vivian Alberts developed a thin film solar panel, solar cell, rather, based on cadmium selenide. And South Africa was very excited, the entire research community, we're going to finally have a South African and African-made solar cell. However, there was not a system to incorporate that invention to translate it into an innovation. And after two, three, four years of trying to find financing, to find the manufacturers, he gave up and licensed this technology to a German firm that sells those solar cells embedded in panels and sells those today. And then South Africa probably has to buy those panels from him. Today, there's ongoing research at the CSIR and universities on very cutting edge energy technologies, so-called desensitized solar cells that are sensitive to light and can uh, attract as much energy as possible, absorb that energy organic solar cells or plastic solar cells. So these are flexible solar cells. You can roll a solar panel and put it in your pocket, and when you get to where you need to use it, you roll it out and you plug your, you charge your phone, you charge your uh, radio, you can watch, you can have a little light to read and so on. So these are really advanced technologies, and yet we have two-thirds of the continent still without light. In addition to this learning by, by searching, this R&D-based knowledge, there's also some efforts at manufacturing going on. To the left is a vertical axis wind turbine. This is sitting in an aerospace lab run by an Indian uh, professor who is able to build windmills just by using bicycle parts. Just all the rotating parts of the bicycle, he scrap metal and so on, 
uses to build this windmill. Of course, it's based on advanced aerodynamics, so you need the knowledge. But in terms of the parts, you can build that. And he's able to get students to build this for him. On the right is a micro hydroelectric pump, also built with scrap metal. Um, this is a, a Kenyan researcher. So we have the learning by searching. We have the R&D-based knowledge. We have the, R the learning by doing, the actual building and manufacturing. We have the users, or the would-be users, the intended users, in our villages and, and small towns and peri-urban areas. This schematic shows that you can actually adapt cutting-edge technologies to a rural setting in a way that meets their end use in, in an affordable way. So what's missing? These linkages, the social system, the building alliances. So what can we do to address this energy problem? I have a few suggestions, and I'm sure you have many more. One is to align your own individual skills with others who have complementary skills. Build these alliances, build bridges. Some people are good in financing, others are scientists, but no one person can do it alone. We have to identify others who share this common goal and work towards that goal. Secondly, you have to stick with it. Innovation is not an event. It's an ongoing process of learning. So you have to continue learning, improving your skills, and then share that knowledge with others so it can be diffused across, across, the countries, across our countries. Then you have to demonstrate these examples. As I said, the governments tend to focus on the large-scale technologies but if you show them that smaller scale technologies can have an equivalent or greater impact on the environment, on reducing po poverty, on social justice, as well as economic development, they may decide to back it and push it and finance these technologies. Another suggestion of something we can do is, is to build a movement around our collective well-being. If we focus on sanitation, water, energy, we can improve our well-being. We can boost our self-confidence, we can actually solve our problem, and we can raise the dignity of African people. In my view, there's nothing else to do but to, do, to attempt to improve our lives and improve our dignity and boost our self-confidence. Thank you for your attention.